And listen as our choir sings, The Old Rugged Cross Made the Difference. Thank you, choir. Take your hymnals once again, page 575. Stand with us, page 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Please stand. Sing that first. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Leaning on the everlasting arms, Leaning, leaning, Safe and secure from all alarms, Leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. As the 
Williamson was play through that a time or two. Get around, and shake hands with your neighbor. Tell them you're glad to see them. Please be seated. And right now we have Brother Enoch to come sing for you. Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me every day he comes to me with new assurance more and more I understand his words of love but I'll never know just why he came to save me Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me oh how much he cared for me no one ever cared for me 
like my Jesus. Oh, how much he cared for me. Thank you very much, Enoch. Kind of irritating to know there's a guy around that not only can beat you at basketball, but can also outsing you. Just something about that doesn't sit right with me. I'm talking about me, Dr. Smith, not you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, he can either beat you nor outsing you, and we understand that. All right, it's Father's Day. Somewhere, somewhere is Admiral Steve Sidebacher, and they are going to hand out little gifts. Now, we bought, these are great. Now, number one, they've got the real Bible on them here. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, Isaiah 40, 31. To run, not grow weary, to walk and not faint. Not a track race or a hiking trail, but life's marathon. Both the monotony and the crises that call for all we have to give and give and give some more. It's not in us to endure like that. And so we wait. We wait upon the Lord who strengthens, forgives, upholds. And uh, this is a little light. And uh, it's going to be good for something. Batteries are included. How about that, see? You don't get that at Walmart, do you? <laughs> Clips onto almost anything and swivels 360 degrees. So if every, if every father will stand up, I believe we have one for them. Is that correct, Dr. Cedarbacher? All right. Fathers, would you stand? And now the ladies will cheer like crazy. Uh, Troy, you could uh, take a walk over and help out Castor. I don't, I don't think Donnie wants to give him one. Did, you didn't get one, did you yet, Castor? Donnie was giving them all the way to his girlfriends and didn't have any left for the fathers. <laughs> all right, and uh, we got the, the general up here, Mr. Alasiris, General Alasiris. All right, did we get everybody? All right, thank you. you. May be seated. Another hand for the father. Now, because we had a drawing for the mothers, we're having a drawing for the fathers. And I hope we treated them as well as we did the mothers, Mrs. Cedarbacher and Pastor uh, Admiral Cedarbacher. Never. It doesn't happen that way. Come on up here. Come on up. Would you, uh, Dr. Cedarbacher? Only in our dreams. Let's see. Carr, would you come over here and do the drawing? Okay. Oh. There's one in there that's a little bent up, Carla. You know, just <laughs> grab that one. You, All right. That's your number. I that's, drew for you. That's my number you drew for? Okay, Steve, would you say something about this? Because I don't really know enough about it to explain it. It's just... Fathers are following in suit with those great mothers, and we're going to have a drawing. We have two prizes. They're in my pocket here. And uh, if, if, did every father get a number? Who's missing? Okay. You can have mine. <laughs> I was going to run back there. What did Alney say one time? I'm not. Only don't want to mess with me. 
Number six. <laughs> I am so sick of this. <laughs> okay, you want to tell me who you got? <clears throat> yeah. I got 50 bucks. <laughs> $50. Is that first prize? Or is that <laughs> first prize. First prize. There's one more. Number seven. He has to come up here. Thank you. Go ahead and say like, something. I got a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. I want the Vietnam veterans uh, hat. <laughs> Even though I never earned it. I don't like the fact that no white people want anything here. <laughs> All right. Announcements, coming events, June 22nd, work day. All these buying donuts. <laughs> Please note, our Wednesday, June 26th service will be changed to Thursday, June 27th. So that's a, a Wednesday away from this Wednesday, I believe. And uh, it'll be changed on that day, so we'll meet on Thursday. No service on a Wednesday, but there is one on Thursday. So don't anybody quit church or anything because we didn't have church on Wednesday night. That's been done before. June 30th, fifth Sunday sing in potluck after the morning service. Sing will begin at 1.30 p.m. For fathers everywhere, fathers don't get thanked enough for all the help they give. <laughs> I know that. For things they do to make each day a happier one to live. Fathers don't get praised enough for being good and kind, for keeping others' hopes and aims so constantly in mind. That's why it's so important when a day like this is here to say the things we leave unsaid so often through the year. Thank you for it. And uh, we've got this great track, <clears throat> the Touch of the Master's Hand. One of the great poems of all time. And I know, uh, well, I heard the buddy used to run through this every now and then at church. And the first time I heard it, I was overwhelmed. And what a great testimony. And right along with the choir song, the cross made the difference. Amen? Amen. Same concept. And if you haven't read this poem, uh, by all means, grab this track. And this track is going to affect anybody that reads it. Guaranteed. Great, great poem and great message with it. And also out there, I picked up one of these calendars. And I think it'd be good for everybody to grab one and circle the Sundays so you make sure you're not anywhere else in 2013 on Sundays. Naturally, we get no response out of that because everybody's under conviction. <laughs> I'd like to now... We have an anniversary. Any birthdays uh, going on? Brother Pritchett's with us. One of his crowd must have a birthday today, right? <laughs> oh, this week. Yeah, there we go. When's your birthday? 15th. And what's your first name again? All right. We're going to sing happy birthday to Joel. Any other birthdays? I got a certain wisdom about this thing, like the Pentecostals. <laughs> Somebody here has a birthday this week. We're going to sing happy birthday. happy birthday, and then we'll get anniversary for Benny. You're going to come down and be close to your bride during while we sing? Yeah. All right. Good answer, Benny. <laughs> <coughs> Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. 
Okay, Ben and Donnell, happy anniversary. Wait a minute, how many is this? Five years. All right, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Carla, we should have named him Lyle Smith Mitchell. I never stopped to realize he pulled the same stunt that your dad did and got married right around Mother's Day. And the only thing is, it's not right around her birthday, because every year, Pastor tells us, uh, you know, we married on Mother's Day, uh, our anniversary, and a birthday. When's her birthday? In May. And he says, so he can just give her one card. How does that go, Dr. Smith? Happy birthday, Mother, on your anniversary. There you go. Well, happy birthday, Mother, on your anniversary. <laughs> All right. I'd like to ask a missionary, Jay Pritchard, to come and just give us a quick word, and then uh, we'll get the offering down. I'll ask him to bless the offering. I've known Jay for a long, long time. Sir. He'd been a veteran missionary and came back uh, because of health issues in the family. And he's going to get out there and try to get something going down in Orange County. And we want to help him. Thank you. I appreciate that. We we stole something. I don't know if you see, use that word or not, but we stole something uh, from your church that was in your announcements. Uh, and then we started it in Madagascar, and the church is still doing it today. They loved it. It was a very long service sometimes. Well, we implemented that fifth Sunday sing into our uh, Sunday services. We, we, we knew that we, we picked it up from here and, uh, they, they really enjoyed that, but it's a blessing to be a part of that. And, and I just got a, an email from Pastor Chris, the national pastor that's there in Madagascar. And he, he sent me pictures of the, the, the church there, the new church they're starting. And that's how it works. Amen. You start a church, then they start a church, and they, yep. they have a church planting vision. Amen. Amen. And uh, so that's that's good to see that. And uh, he's actually he's he's excited. He's really praying that God will bring another person in there, which there is a, another young man. It's going to be a few years before he's he's um, uh, old enough to be able to uh, uh, pastor it and and have some experience. But uh, he's he's looking forward. He's he's he's, he's he was emailing me saying, you know, God's burning my heart that, that, uh, we need other, we need other churches started in other parts of Madagascar. And I'm looking, I'm still looking at, at going to other parts of Madagascar. And so that's a blessing to see that continuing on like that. And God brought us back here, but we yet still gave us the burden, uh, to do church planning work also. And, uh, in Northern Orange County, uh, we, we, we researched in a, a lot of cities around in the area of Stanton and, and Garden Grove and around in there and, uh, found actually, well, uh, very, very, very few, if any, uh, churches, uh, the, uh, independent Baptist churches in, in, especially in the, in the, around the area of Stanton. And so that's what we're, we're looking at, at, at getting, uh, getting started with that. Uh, we've had a few bumps in the road as we were getting going. Um, but we are, our goal is we're hoping to be moved over, uh, closer in that area by next month and just see how the Lord makes everything happen in the ways of getting started on meetings. And, uh, that's how it is. Just kind of wait for the Lord to open doors. But at the same time, uh, God laid a verse, God laid a scripture on my heart earlier when Ephraim and Manasseh were, were saying, uh, they were divvying up the land and Ephraim and Manasseh were, uh, asking Joshua, can we have a little more land? Because we're two tribes. Right. And, uh, Joshua said, see that over there? You can have that over there if you go cut down the trees and you go take care of it. And he, Ephraim and Manasseh, from the reading, I'll, I'll insert a little bit from the reading. It was like, you know, is there something a little easier? Is there something that maybe we can do that's, and Joshua said, if you want it, go get it. And God's just burdened in my heart. You know, a lot of times people like to sit back and say, man, I just wish God would bless. I wish God would move. I wish God would work. Just let him. Yeah. Just go do it and let him. Amen. Amen. So we pray for offering, Pastor. Gentlemen, would you come and we'll take the offering. Amen. 
Amen. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today and to hear your word again, dear God in heaven, as we did in Sunday school. We pray for an anointing in the in the uh, worship service, that your word would touch our hearts, dear God, that we would leave from here today convicted, comforted, and challenged by your word, dear God. We pray as we take this offering time that you bless it for the furtherance of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray this, dear God. Amen. 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 Thank you, ladies. Take your hymnals one last time. Please stand with us. Page 404. And let's sing Faith of Our Fathers. Page number 404. Please stand with us. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of kids you're dismissed sing that last faith of our fathers we will both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly Please be seated. And right now we have Julie to come sing for you. I've sung when I had fears Some folks have even questioned If it's all been just a show But the reason that I'm singing I want the world to know I sing because there is an empty grave I sing because there is a power that saves I sing because His grace is real to me Oh, and I 
sing because I am not alone. I sing because someday I'm going home where I shall sing through all eternity. I've sung to those who are walking through the fiery trials. I've watched their saddened faces turn into happy smiles. I've bowed my head and whispered, Lord, please do the same for me. And I'm glad that I can tell you He's always given victory And I sing because There is an empty grave I sing because There is a power that saves I sing because His grace is so real to me Oh, and I sing because I am not alone, I sing because Someday I'm going home where I shall sing Through all eternity Oh, and I sing because I am not alone, I sing because Someday I'm going home where I shall sing Through all eternity Eternity, eternity. Thank you, Julie, choir, Enoch, and all our instrumentalists. Thank you for that. And Father's happy Father's Day to one and all. Now, I've preached before, and maybe everybody in the world has, but I thank God for my three fathers. And uh, I broke the one of them down into a couple, could add to it, but Buddy Franklin's the man that I got saved under. And uh, Chet Littlefield's the guy I prayed with. He was doing the altar work and prayed with him, and he was a big influence in my life, and other people have been, of course, as well, including Dr. Smith. Then there's my earthly father, Gerald Mitchell, and, of course, my Heavenly Father, the Lord God Almighty. So I thank God for all of those. And I've probably talked about Buddy Franklin sufficiently. I talked to him again this morning, and uh, so did my wife a little bit. He said he was going to send my wife a ticket so she could come out to play the piano at the Messiah Baptist Church. And I think he was talking about a one-way ticket, but that ain't going to happen. So I've talked about him quite a bit. Uh, you've heard uh, most of my Father's Day stories about the original Buzz Mitchell. And we can, of course, never talk too much about our Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Amen? Now, in general reference, the Bible tells us to honor our fathers. That's Exodus 20, 12. And it simply states as fact in Malachi 1, 6, that a son honoreth his father. Just puts that out there as, as a basic fact in the midst of other facts being given. And Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3 even says this, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Which I can only assume, if I'm going to interpret that verse, that it means if you don't honor your father, you won't live long on earth, because your dad will probably kill you. <laughs> and by the way, Ephesians chapter 6 calls that a promise. Okay, so that kind of humor is politically incorrect. It's about 50 years out of date, even as a joke, and I apologize for it and move on. Now, personally speaking, and make no mistake about it whatsoever, I love and did love my father. I think about him, as we often say, all the time. My father would do anything for me. He always had my safety and my best interests at heart. He sacrificed for me. He seemed to enjoy my company. He was proud of uh, what little accomplishments that I achieved, and at points, uh, to my own embarrassment. He was just a great guy, and I'm so thankful for him. Part of my prayer list, uh, first now is praying for my bride, but part of my prayer list is thanking God for both my the mother and the father that God gave me. 
And uh, I feel sorry for people that didn't have a father like I did. Now, obviously, all of those things and much, much more to a much, much greater degree can be said about our Heavenly Father. Whatever I can say about my earthly father, uh, the song that Enoch said, uh, saying, you know, nobody ever loved me like Jesus. And that's a fact. So we could say everything I can say about my earthly father, much, much more about my heavenly father. And that's where we have the spiritual application in parallel on Father's Day, and it's properly so. But the day is intended to move us to honor and appreciate our earthly fathers. Now, I've complained about special days, and uh, Buddy Franklin was complaining to me about it today. I said he preached a message, didn't think it was very good. And I told him what people have told me, that, you know, uh, Jay gets hired on special days after, you know, over over 20 years of doing it, and total over, you know, I've preached on this stuff probably 30 times or something. You say, well, what am I going to say today about fathers that I haven't said 29 other times? And uh, people are probably saying, well, it's no different than the rest of your messages. But, um, <clears throat> but people enjoy special days. Now, you know me, I'd like to change them all to Saturday. You know, I think Easter should be changed to Saturday celebration. Because people won't come to church on Easter because they're home celebrating Easter with their family and Aunt Matilda. Now's the time to say it, right? You can't say it on Easter Sunday morning. Everybody's already planning on skipping Sunday night. You can't say anything then. They'll get mad at you. But right now on Father's Day, probably say anything I want to about Easter. Anyway, the day is intended to move us to honor and appreciate our earthly fathers. And as Christians, we do speak of all three fathers on Father's Day. I'd just like to make this point before we kind of get going. Honoring someone is a conscious decision of the will. I want to say that. I'm going to try to prove it a little bit or substantiate it or back it up. But honoring someone is a conscious decision of the will. Now, sure, there are times that our expressions of honor and appreciation are involuntary actions. I'm sure there are times that they just flow out of us like breathing or like your heartbeat. And I suppose your honor can, at times, flow like that, be an involuntary action without you even thinking about it. When I think of the song, How Great Thou Art, and think of the words in it, I think of that in the context of a spontaneous honor and exaltation of God. And that's my interpretation of it, or how I feel when I hear it. I, you know, oh, Lord, my God, uh, when I you know consider, you know, you know, thy wonder in the worlds thy hands have made and things like that. To me, that just sounds like a spontaneous praising of God that's coming right out of the heart, and I would call that involuntary action for the Christian. But when it comes to a day-by-day, moment-by-moment, honoring of your father, any one of the three, I believe you have to decide to do it. And Dr. Smith mentioned again what he's said from time to time, gets up in the morning, praise God, would you lead me? And he's talked about other things that he's prayed, bring somebody into my path that I might witness to, and things like that. Well, it has to be a conscious decision. You get up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to take time and ask God to direct my day. And how many times do we have to say, look, boy, I need to pray. I need to read my Bible. Or just kind of remind ourselves, thank God for his goodness, goodness to us. I believe those are conscious decisions. Uh, people don't usually spontaneously run down and say, I want to get saved. If you're going to step out of that pew, you make a decision. You weigh it over. I remember when I stepped out of the pew and I went down to get saved. It's a conscious decision. We are emotional creatures. Yes, we are. But we're also volitional. People who have a will. Sometimes we can be very stubborn. Well, we need to make a decision. You have to decide that you're going to do it. And pre people pretty much think of themselves as number one. Dr. Smith also mentioned that, uh, I think I've seen it in Joy, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself third. And the movie about Gail Sayers and uh, Brian Piccolo, I am third. And a book was written, I am third. And it talked about that very concept. Jesus first, 
others second, and I am third. Now, I wonder how many of us, if we were all to bow our heads and said, well, we got those kind of reversed. I'm not asking you to stand up and raise your hand or anything. But in the flesh, the natural inclination of the flesh is to take care of ourselves. We certainly see it all the time in immature children of all ages. But as we mature over time and growth, we learn to think of others. And then we discipline ourselves in that manner. So this morning, with that in mind, I'd like to take five quick spiritual principles and encourage each of us to employ them in terms of their fathers. Now there's a little catch in the message. The young kids are all gone now in junior church, so they won't hear this. Uh, for some of us old folks, it's too late. Our fathers are already gone. But that leaves a select few whose parents are still living. But regardless, the principles are all good. And sometimes it's good for the fathers to reflect on fatherhood itself. Okay, my father's in heaven, Lord willing. Made a decision to receive Christ three weeks before he died. Now, I don't need that for my father. I'm not preaching it to my sons necessarily or exclusively to them. But it's good for me to reflect on fatherhood itself. The principles are good. And to make sure that as fathers, we ourselves honor fatherhood as an institution, if you will. Because we need to honor it. That we honor the position of father by being the kind of father that might cause our sons and daughters to honor them. Now, I'm not shifting the responsibility. That lies with the children. When God gives a command, well, the burden's on you. He commands us to be baptized. Then the burden's on you if you haven't been baptized. And I'm not shifting the burden from the children to the parents here. But if God commands others to honor us as fathers, it's only reasonable that we who are honored would strive to live our lives in an honorable fashion. Amen? So God says our kids are to honor us. All right? Then I, I'd say it's implicit, if you will, in that, that I live my life in such a way that I would be honored. So there is a burden. I'm not shifting the responsibility. We ought to honor our parents, period. So we'll figure there's a good reason for bringing these principles to the fore, and off we go. Now remember, sometimes we're blind to the obvious. There was a guy, I hate to mention secular songs, but uh, yeah, I guess I really don't. But uh, Clarence Frogman Henry. That's his trade name, because he sang a song like, I'm, I'm, I'm singing like a frog. And uh, anyway, he sang a song, You Always Hurt the One You Love. Anybody ever heard of that song? All right. You old codgers, you. <laughs> Olney didn't raise his hand. You always hurt the one you love. Look, sometimes the most obvious stuff, we miss it. You like Jimmy's dad or Freddie's dad, but wait a minute. Your, dad, your dad's the guy that's putting the food on the table. Your dad's the guy that's clothing you. Your dad, and Carlos pointed this out at times, and said, look, when you're down and out, who's going to be there for you? Your mom and your dad are. So you can go around and say, well, he's been like a father to me. Oh, she's been like a mother to me. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but I'll tell you, your mother is your mother. She's the one that's been like a mother to you, and your father's your father, and he's the one that's been like a father to you. And we ought never forget that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, thank you. We have the Bible. and God, we do thank you for these special days because it kind of taps us in the head and said, hey, let's pay attention to these things that God has given to us. God has established motherhood. God has established fatherhood. We ought to mention it every now and then. And think about it, and I've got five principles today briefly that we can go over. So, God, would you bless? Thank you for our Heavenly Father. Nothing is more important than that. The cross made the difference. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, remember, the minute we mention a relationship, and that's what we're talking about, 
There has to be a relationship. You can't have a father without a child. And that's by definition of father. And once a father is in play, there also has to be a relationship by definition. And the Bible says, beloved, now we're the sons of God. Amen? Amen. There's a relationship we're talking about. So the minute you mention relationship, there are two sides to it. Example, husband and wife. There's a relationship. There are two sides. And I believe this with all my heart. In God's economy, that relationship, any relationship that he puts together is to be mutually beneficial. I believe that. Husband and wife, right? Uh, you know, husbands love your wives, wives obey your husbands, be reverent to them and all of that. It's a mutual relationship. It's symbiotic, if you will, where we help one another. And you say, well, father, son, not quite the same, preacher. Okay, when you preach it, that's the way you preach it. But I'll tell you this, I believe this. There is to be a special bond there that's going to be mutually beneficial. I believe that. Now let's keep that in mind this morning as we present five decisions of the will concerning fatherhood. Five decisions of the will concerning fatherhood. Number one, I'm going to go quickly. Respect the position. Now, 1 Corinthians 4.15 says this. Paul writes and he says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Spiritually speaking, they had one father, it was Paul. Not 10,000, not five, not two, one. It's a singular position. It's one that no, nobody can take it away. It's literally a birthright, if you will. Because when your son is birth, born, you got that right. Now, it's a little twist on the definition of birthright, but that's what it is. And it's an exalted position. Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, if you're a father, you ought to magnify that office. You ought to respect the position. What a great thing it is to be a father. Responsibility? Sure, there's a lot more to it. But but right off the bat, let's respect the father. So, well, I'm not much. Wait a minute, you're a father, you're something special. And boy, it's a great thing to be a father. Make the decision today to live that position. How many times have we heard people, in, and I don't want to say too much about this point because i got five of them, and who knows when I'm going to run into the next point coming. But how many times have people lamented the fact that they haven't taken advantage of the time they had as a father? And now the kid's grown up and say, boy, I'd like to go back and do this and this and this. Sometimes I think that's why they give us grandkids. How many people say amen to that? <laughs> amen? You know, you can correct the mistakes you do. You made before. And, um, of course, sometimes you can't beat them like you did your own kids, but it's still a blessing to have them. <laughs> Number two. So respect the position. Number two, respect the pleasure. In 2 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul wrote this. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? Now look, we come out, we preach. Paul preached. I mean, he, he brought him up short in 1 Corinthians. You go back and look at it, and he had a right to do it, didn't he? Guy shacking up with his stepmother and everything, the drunk at the Lord's table. He had plenty of reason to criticize him. But in 2 Corinthians, he acknowledged, look, you're my joy. It's not my job. It's not my purpose or my function to make you miserable because I'm getting my joy from you. I don't want to make you sorry. I want to make you happy. Respect the pleasure. We're back to that two-way street of a relationship. In the midst of responsibility, effort, sacrifice, compromise, blood, sweat, and tears, understand that the relationship of a father and a child is one of the greatest pleasures in this life. It's just a great pleasure. We've gotten a lot of joy out of our kids, haven't we? So don't miss that. No, I'm going to go take care of the kids. Wait a minute. I'll tell you, I'll remind you again of what Fred Nady said. He said, yeah, you're tired of all the clutter? And picking up after your kids and everything, just pray that God will take away the source of the clutter. And all of a sudden, you got a different perspective. Amen? You got a different perspective. Make the decision today 
to appreciate that part of being a father, the pleasure of it. Make that decision. So when you get ticked off at your kid or you didn't put the bike away or whatever and, you know, all of that, hey, don't forget, this is one of your... I told Mrs. Smith I wasn't going to pound the pulpit today. Um, <clears throat> make the decision today to look at your kids and say, boy, thank God, and I'm respecting the pleasure I get out of having those kids. Thirdly, respect the price. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, Behold, a third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, Paul said, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, I hate that verse, but the parents for the children. The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Respect the price. It costs money to be a parent. I didn't learn that till our fifth one came along. <laughs> it costs money to be a parent. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's always going to be. What my parents did for me, what our parents did for us, or maybe in some cases they should have done but didn't, but my parents were very good to me. You say, I know that. You look like a spoiled child. That's what you were thinking, isn't it, Larry? Yeah, see, I know, I know what you're thinking. But listen, my parents were good to me. They took care of me. And uh, we're to do that for our kids. We're to do that for our kids. I've told you every story there is, and it's not time to do it. But look, my mother wakes me up and says, you know, my dad, dad got a bonus at work, and he wants to buy you a couple of tires for your 65 Mustang Fastback. Oh, thank you very much. You know, my dad was good to me. I'd come home from college and it'd be coats, you know, nice winter coats, or maybe a suit there in the living room. I said, oh, my mother went to Flanders. They had two sales a year. One was around wintertime, and I'd come home, and man, maybe I'd have a nice suit or a nice coat. And my parents, you know, they did that for me. You know, they, I had a car loan for the Mustang and paying the outrageous, I think it was about 60 bucks a month on the payment. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, they did. They had uh, something there where they could raise the rate on you. Amazing that a bank would do that. I guess it was a variable loan. And uh, my mother came home one day and she said, uh, no, they uh, raised the rate on the loan on your Mustang. We got a notice in the mail and I didn't like that, so I paid it off and you can just pay me. Okay, thanks, Mom. You know, so, uh, you know, parents step up and took care of you, you know. I went over and bought a house one time with a check from my mother. How about that? Hand him a check, <laughs> had a house, paid her. And so my parents, I mean, they sacrificed. And, and parents, respect the price. Understand that it's going to cost you money. That's what fathers do. And kids, don't develop an entitlement mode. And parents, don't get into a an enablement mode. Don't do everything for them. Teach them some responsibility and everything. But still, we're there. We're either parents or we're kids. And we need to make the decision today to embrace sacrifice. You know, Buddy said I would squeeze a nickel till the buffalo grunted. <laughs> but every now and then, hey, spend some money on your kids. Sacrifice for them. You don't have to tell my wife about that. She'll spend, figure if she's got a hundred bucks, she'll spend a hundred one. But then some of us are watching the pennies a little closer. But look, they're your kids, right? They're your kids. Help them out. Sacrifice for them. Respect the sacrifice. And then respect the passion. In Philippians 2.22, Paul wrote this and he, he wrote and he said, you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Why do you think there's a VFW and an American Legion? Veterans of foreign wars and, on another case, are there two different organizations? The American Legion. Veterans of foreign wars, you had to serve on the foreign field during time of war. American Legion, you can be in that if you're just in during time of war. Or I'm eligible for American Legion, not for the VFW. But uh, why do you think those organizations exist? And I'll tell you why. There's a bond of service there. Now, my kids have served together with me in the gospel. 
from the early, early days, and I mean early. I don't know for sure, but uh, Buzz and Ben, I think they were on the fifth and seventh grade when we worked on this roof. Help me out, Ben. Right around there, Ben had a cast on his leg. Buzz, Ben, and me, we got down here about 5.30 in the morning before the heat of the day hit, and we take one of these sections and start stripping it. And they were little kids, well, I mean young. And uh, we stripped them, threw them off, filled up the dumpsters. We had two dumpsters at the time, threw them in the dumpsters, and then hoped it didn't rain till Saturday when the crew showed up and we were part of the crew, and we'd shingle one at a time. We took five weeks. We served together in the gospel. Now, it's a special thing. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying there's a bond in serving together. There was a bond in serving together. And Tonya, Tara, and Lyle served as well in other areas more appropriate to their gender and skills. You know, when we had work days down here when the ladies are doing these things, they were down there. And Lyle's uh, done his kind of service uh, in different things. And uh, speaking of Lyle, I got a call from him today. You know, I the kid, he's over there suffering in Greece right now. And he called me up and said, Happy Father's Day, Father. Can I, can I have some more money? And I said, Sure. Uh, so... <laughs> But there is a passion there in serving together. So make the decision today to know the extremely high value of serving Jesus Christ together. Don't ever despise the value of serving Christ together. That's part of the bond. And it's a blessing. So respect that. Respect the passion of serving Christ together. And then respect the period. Here's one of my favorite verses. You can turn to it later. I'm trying to push through here. But in Genesis 47, 9, Jacob said unto Pharaoh. So Jacob is down there in Egypt, and he's talking to Pharaoh. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. He's 130 years old. Now listen to what he says. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Now, Jacob was pretty much telling the truth, huh, preacher? <laughs> He'd been pretty much a dirty rat. But he was a man of faith. And God blessed him. And he said, few and evil have been the days of the years of my, uh, the days of the years of my life been. And I've not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. Now, I love that. What's it, say, what's it say to me? It says, come on, we don't have all day. We don't have all day. We've got a few days of the years of our life. Make the decision today to understand that concept and to use that understanding to make every day count in your father-child relationships. I don't know if it was Betty Martin I was talking to or who it was. And somebody said, man, uh, my children are now on Medicare. And I saw Betty yes the other day in, in the hospital. She's doing real well. Uh, keep her in prayer. Keep uh, Mrs. Uh, DeBaca, Steve's mom, in prayer. She's in the hospital recovering. And uh, pray for her. And Debbie Beam called, and she's sick, so pray for her, too. But, uh, you know, we look around, and, and Buzz is 35. Buzz and Tonya are 35. So how in the world could that happen? And, and as, as I mentioned to people, yes. It is true, I'm celebrating my 50th class reunion. Carla and I are both celebrating our 50th class reunion coming up uh, this summer. Now, mine is high school and hers is kindergarten, but still, it's, the, <laughs> it's a 50th reunion. But we only have a few days. These days go by in a hurry. Make the decision today to understand that concept and to use that understanding to make every day count in your father-child relationships. Now, mothers probably know this as well as anybody else because when they're real little, I'm just waiting till they grow up. Can I get an amen from the fathers on that? No, preacher, you're on your own. <laughs> but look, mothers with those little babies, man, they love them. Every mother loves every baby they ever see. They want to look at their toes. I want to pick them up. Oh, you know, and me, I'm, you know, when they're real young, I'm afraid to pick them up. You know? I'm not afraid I'll hurt them. I'm afraid they're going to throw up on me. <laughs> or worse. Mothers can tell you how quickly those days pass. And boy, I'll tell you, 
God bless those mothers that have lost a child in the, in the military and war, but I'll guarantee you they can remember when they were little babies like it was five minutes ago. These times of life go by so quickly. And you know, look at me and say, yeah, old man, sure, I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, you get along a few years and you'll look back and say, where did they go? Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Now you say, the, what period? I said, respect the period. What period are you talking about? Obviously, the period of your life in general. But what really counts is the productive period. Some people have a stroke and lie 20 years in a nursing home. And guess what? They can't go to their kid's little league game then. They can't show up at their birthday party. They can't give them five bucks on their birthday. You don't know how much productive time you've got. Don't waste it all on everything else and neglect your kids. Respect the period that you have. The clock of life is wound but once. And no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. So live, love, toil with a will. Do not depend upon tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. It happened some years ago that a most urgent and unusual invitation came to me, not me personally, I'm giving a, a testimony from another man, to visit a military academy in which the students had mutinied. I was called in the hope that I might be of service to the situation. The students had struck in everything, among them lessons, study halls, drill time. Upon my arrival, the headmaster handed me a large number of telegrams, which had come from the parents who had been wired regarding the situation. So people had found out, parents had found out what was going on with the kids at the military academy, and they had sent in telegrams. And this man said these messages on the telegrams were tele telescopes through which one could look into the hearts of the various fathers who had sent them and see their relationships with their sons. One father, one father wired his son, I expect you to obey. Another said, if you are expelled from school, you needn't come home. Still another, I'll send you to an insane, insane asylum if you are sent home. Another said, I'll cut you off without a shilling if you disgrace the family. But the last message this man read was couched in these brief words. Steady, my boy, steady. That's all he said. Steady, my boy, steady. There was a man who believed in his child. And probably there's no greater influence upon a child than a father who respects the spirit of his son and treats him like a man. Maybe if they issued perfect fathers, they'd issue perfect kids. What do we do? We stick with them. We, we don't condone sin. But we stick with them. And when they're on that verge, maybe going the wrong direction, can hold up the word of God, say, steady, my boy, steady. Respect the position, respect the pleasure, respect the price, respect the passion, and respect the period. Oh, God, we thank you. You are a heavenly father. I'm sure you'll give us a little chastisement. Probably nothing like we really deserve, if we're to be honest. As Dr. Smith said this morning, if we got what we deserved, we'd all be in hell today. But God, you've loved us so much. You've sacrificed for us. You've respected that time period that we have. You have all, all eternity, but we've, we have a brief time to decide to serve you. And God, you've respected the pleasure you take delight in us. And God, these are amazing things. And oh, Father, we're humbled by it. 
we love you. You loved us, and God, we say we were unlovable, but we still in many respects remain unlovable. And God, you love us in spite of ourselves. And God, you're the greatest father ever. And might we be, was it we're to be created in the image of God? Might our fathers, including me, be created in your image of fatherhood? And God, might we act it. And oh God, if there's anyone here today that have not received Jesus Christ as their own personal father, the Bible says, no, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said that. And if we confess the Lord Jesus Christ, we have God the Father. When we acknowledge God the Father, we have God the Son and vice versa. So we need to make very sure, God, that vice versa, if we're not careful, doesn't work. We need to make very sure that we've received Jesus Christ as our own personal Lord and Savior. And that's when we get God the Father as our Heavenly Father. We're always creations of his, but only sons when we accept Jesus Christ as payment for our sins. So God, my first prayer today would be this. If there are any here today that have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, might they come and say, you know, preacher, I've been to church a lot, or might have been baptized when I was a kid, but you know what? I've never really said I want Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I want to make that decision today. I want to know for sure that he's my Savior, that God Almighty is my Heavenly Father, and that I'm going to heaven. I'm going to the Father's house when I leave here. God grant that, we pray. And then for fathers, might we just think about it? All of these things are voluntary decisions we make. God, let us decide to respect every aspect of fatherhood and thank God for the pleasure our children have brought to us. And we pray it all and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.